Uh, and if anybody else pops in, that is totally cool. Um, let me go here. Cool, cool, cool. Well, welcome to my session on ideation toolkit. Uh, what we're going to do is we're basically just going to talk about three different ways to generate ideas once you know what your problem space is. And in the last two sessions, we talked about how to do research to figure out where those problems lie. We talked about uh, how to narrow down your scope and see exactly which problem you want to try to solve. Now that we know which problem we're trying to solve, we're going to go ahead and try to find the solution. So uh, there's a couple different ways you can do that. Uh, we're going to start with one called worst idea. Then we're going to move on to something called crazy eights. And then we're going to talk about the lean UX canvas, which is once you're pretty set on, um, on an idea, how you want to take that forward. All right, so the first one is called worst idea. Uh, it's actually pretty intuitive. You basically just think of the worst idea that you possibly can to solve a problem. And it's a little counterintuitive because you'd think, OK, I'm, I'm trying to find a solution to this problem. I want to find the best idea to how to you know, fix this problem. But a lot of times when we try to think of solutions to issues, we start to like disqualify certain parts of it. And we, we forget a lot about what we learned in the research phase. And so by going into this worst idea exercise, you can actually find not solutions, but guidelines for how you should be designing. So the, the prompt is, based on what you know, when that research we did before, make the worst possible solution. You want to make it as intentionally bad as possible. And it's really interesting how this is really good for the first couple uh, sessions of ideation, because when you start looking at um, the worst possible solution, your brain is a lot more free. You're a lot more creative in that way. And so you're able to think of you know, different things related to that. So we're going to go ahead and give it a shot. Stephanie, I don't know how you want to communicate. You can turn your mic on if you'd like, or you can chat to me uh, different ideas. Um, do you have a particular uh, problem that you guys are trying to solve right now? Uh, have you kind of narrowed your problem space at all? OK, perfect. So we're actually going to do, I had a, an example. We could do the worst idea for Beeline, with this, which is the SCAD buses. But if it's OK with you, I'd like to use uh, yours as an example, just because you, uh, you're here today. I want this to be as useful as possible to you. Um, and I'll just edit this part out. All right. Another idea, I'm just going to kind of spitball here through this. So uh, for example, for the Beeline, uh, an example of worst idea for that is that the buses should come randomly. They should not be at the same time all the time. Uh, we shouldn't tell anyone when they're coming ahead of time. Uh, the buses themselves should be very dirty uh, so that the people feel most at home with them. Um, I think the buses should be very small. They shouldn't have a lot of space on them because, uh, I mean, you only need like one or two passengers anyway. Um, there should only be one bus that goes to every single SCAD location. Uh, and you start to see like, you know, th these are all terrible ideas, but what are we learning through that? Um, you know, the, the variability of time thing, you know, you want buses to be consistent. Um, you know, the one about it, it, one line going throughout all of Savannah. You, you want it to be something that, uh, you know, different lines so that people can get on them quicker. Basically, you don't want to have to get on the bus here and have to wait all the way for it to go over there. Um, and so by doing this worst idea exercise, it's really helpful in the beginning of ideation because it opens your brain up to a different kind of thinking and it helps reinforce that research that you, uh, you learned earlier. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does. It's like um, telling you what not to do, basically. Exactly. It's, it's, you're making a list of things not to do. And it's actually really funny. Um, as you go through your actual solution, when you come to that, you know, that final one that you want to put in front of the judges, sometimes it's interesting to see how close you got to that worst idea because of compromises you might have made. For example, you know, we shouldn't put ads on the SCAD buses. Nobody likes ads. But then you have to find a monetary way to like monetize it. And so like, oh, you know, maybe ads would be OK. And so you start to like sometimes take some of these ideas from the worst idea, um, which should make you feel bad. <laughs> Usually that's, that's the emotional response you want to feel. Um, you want to find a different way to do stuff uh, in that case. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to move on from uh, worst idea. Does that all kind of make sense? Do you feel like you could do worst idea yourself now? Yeah, I think I can be able to do it myself. Yeah. This is, uh, I've done a couple UX projects now, and worst idea is always the one we start out with because um, <laughs> it's just probably the most fun <laughs> and sarcastic, but 
it's also uh, really helpful to widen out your your idea and like get that get that design criteria. All right, so we're already shared. The second activity is crazy eights, and I'm actually going to get some paper. I will be right back. And if you have some paper, you should grab some too. All right. Cool, cool, cool. So crazy eights is probably the most common, uh, especially here uh, in terms of ideation methods. And the idea is that instead of trying to come up with good ideas, we're trying to come up with like not bad ideas, but instead of trying to come up with good ideas, you just try to come up with lots of ideas. Um, and I'll show you how to do that here. So um, first you want to fold a paper three times to make eight different sections. And you're going to number the sections. You're going to start a timer for one minute. Uh, and then go ahead and start it. And then you're going to draw that first idea. And then when the timer ends, you're going to restart the timer and go to the next session. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is uh, fold the paper. Do you have paper by you, Stephanie, by any chance? No, sadly, I don't. Oh, no. OK. Uh, um, yes. What you can do then instead is if you're on a computer, you have like a notes app on your phone, uh, you, can, you can just kind of write them down uh, in those places instead. Um, oh, I could do that. Because the point is more about the idea um, than anything else. All right. Um, but once you finish folding your paper, it should look something like this. And if you unfold it, wow, eight sections. And then after you get those eight sections, oh, excuse me, hello. After you get those eight sections, you're going to go ahead and number them. I'm just going to do that real quick here. All right. If you're doing this on a computer, you can just do like bullet points or something. You can see it numbered those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and these are some ground rules. And this is something I've kind of changed a little bit about Crazy H just because I, I think it's important to, um, to note. So the first ground rule is that you only get one minute for each block. Uh, that might sound like a lot of time. I don't know. It might not sound like a lot of time, but uh, it's not a lot of time when you're trying to think of ideas as a solution to a problem. Uh, the second one is that it has to be the first thing that comes to mind. You have to write down the very first thing that comes to your mind. And that's the whole thing that we're doing here with Crazy Eights is that we're, we're, again, freeing that creativity juice in our brain and not constraining ourselves. And it's okay if it's not a good idea. It probably won't be. But it will probably have elements that we can take from it, uh, just like the worst idea uh, exercise we did before as well. Um, obviously, this isn't possible for you, Stephanie, because you're doing, uh, doing it on a computer. If at all possible, you do want to do this physically on paper. I am a digital man. I use computer everything. But for Crazy Eights, it is important to do it on paper and actually like draw if you have that ability to do so. Um, okay. And the reason that you want to draw it too instead of just writing it on the paper is because when you show it, because that's like part of the Crazy Eights, is that when you show it to everybody and you're discussing your ideas, it needs to be visual. If you just have words, that doesn't really help uh, quite as much as, as it would otherwise. Um, rule number four is no good ideas. <laughs> this is actually a ground rule that I've set. Um, because again, you aren't going to get any good ideas through this uh, method. It's just trying to think of like as many different ideas as possible so that you can learn as much as possible uh, about your uh, topic space. And also, no excuse. You know, when you're going through these ideas, they're all going to be bad. That's OK. When we go to share them, don't say, you know, I'm so sorry. You know, all my ideas were bad. Uh, that's OK. That's not an issue. Uh, that, that's part of the point is that we have a bunch of bad ideas. But I cannot tell you how many times I've been doing this. And we'll have like three or four people go. And then someone will say something like, oh, you know what? I like that aspect of yours. And I like that aspect of yours. Let's combine those or refine those. And then you start getting where your solution is. Um, so it's a really good exercise. This is how most of the ideating done is done in uh, in the UX uh, program here. So um, we're going to go ahead and give it a shot. Uh, again, I had a, a fake topic. Um, I'm going to do like a pizza delivery service where I want like better pizza delivery. You're more than welcome to Stephanie if you'd like, um, or you can do your topic space if you want to give that a shot too. I'm okay with that. 
Okay. I think I can try my topics first. Yeah, for sure. And I'd love to see like what different uh, kind of solutions you came up with. Um, but let's go ahead and give it a shot. Can you see the timer on my screen here? Yeah, I can. Cool, cool, cool. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get started here. And for the next eight minutes, we're going to be drawing and or writing uh, what our you know, different ideas are for this solution. Are you ready? Yes. All right. I'm going to go ahead and start and go. All right, go on to square number two. All right, square number three. All right, square number four. All right, square number five, we're halfway done.
All right, number six. Number seven, almost done. All right, number eight, last one. All right. So, how did that go? How do we feel about that uh, that process? Uh, it was nerve wracking. <laughs> it's a lot, uh, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it is. Did you get an and idea then, for all eight sections? I don't think I did. <laughs> I wasn't even counting after a while. But then I tried to, because I'm actually doing the Zoom on my phone, so I tried to find the nearest computer, and. Yeah, I decided to use like pictures from online, so it was hard to find those pictures. But yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and that's totally fine. And props to you for even just following along with me. Cause it like you said, it can be nerve-wracking, it can be yeah. um very intense. As you do this more, you get better and better about like not being too selective about the ideas you put down. Uh so if it's okay with you, I'm gonna share with you the ones that I did for the pizza uh delivery. Okay. This is a little hard on Zoom, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to make it as good as possible. So the problem we're trying to solve is pizza delivery is boring. We want to find a new way to do pizza delivery. And so my first idea was that uh, we just have a chain of delivery people that just kind of like throw the pizza to each other. <laughs> um, and that'd be kind of fun. And that'd be an exciting way to like get your pizzas, like, you know, like catch it as a as a delivery person. Uh, I thought about like, what if we had their cars like decked out with RGB LEDs so that like, as soon as like the pizza guy's going through, like, you know that it's the pizza guy is like, oh, yeah, the super flashy car. Um, I thought it'd be cool if we had a, a pizza box that when you open it up, it made like music, like it would be like, oh, like it's your pizza, like it would almost and it'd be like lights come out of it. It's like this celebratory moment that like your pizza's here, you can finally get it. Um, 
I had another one for number four where the pizza delivery person has a GoPro on their head that mm -hmm. is like streaming like where they are and how they're getting to your house and stuff like that. So you can like watch them as they're coming over. Um, the fifth one, I was struggling for the fifth one, but I thought of an idea where you could uh, like the pizza delivery box, instead of being a box, it's a cube and it's like vacuum mm -hmm. sealed so that <laughs> the pizza toppings don't like get like all over the place, but also a vacuum is a very good thermal insulator. So it would like mm -hmm. keep it hot and fresh and stuff like that. Um, for my number six, I had, this is a little fantastical, but um, I had an idea of like, you know, the old commercials that are like, you wouldn't download a car. Like I thought about like, what if you could download a pizza and like <laughs> just download it to your, your stove or something like that. Um, which I guess you could do if you had like all the ingredients in your stove and you just like clicked configure and it would like make it in your, in your stove for you. That would be kind of cool. Um, number seven was the pizza people were like, all right, I'm, uh, I'm making your pizza. And then you get another call when the next person's like, all right, cool. I'm going to bring it over. And then the last person's like, all right, I'm here. But the idea behind that is that like, there's always someone excited, like telling you like, Hey, like, guess what? Like your pizza's coming. Like, I can't wait to sh share it with you. Like, I can't wait for you to see it. Um, and then the last one would be like, if you could control the music in the person's, uh, the delivery person's car. And you could like pump it up really loud so that when you like heard your music, it would like, you'd be like, oh, that's my music. It's the pizza guy. <laughs> like you could do <laughs> the, the songs that uh, they were listening to it. So that would like tell you anyway. Um, so what, what was useful about those ideas? Literally nothing, absolutely nothing. From that. <laughs> All of these are terrible ideas. Uh, but if you remember, one of the rules is that there's no good ideas. Um, kind of like the worst idea thing what you learn from this is more important than the actual ideas that you have. For example, I think, let's see, one of them with the GoPro, two of them with the status thing, three of them were related to updating the user on the status of their pizza. Um, one of, or two of them had to do with the actual vehicle. And so you start seeing like the, the areas that you're, you're putting effort into is like, oh, I think that's an area oh. we could touch her. You know, I think that would be a, a, an experience that we could promote. Um, two of them were about celebrating the fact that, hey, your pizza's here. You know, we're having a good time now. In fact, three of them, arguably, the, the one where you open it up and it sings to you, the one where the people are calling you and they're always excited to let you know, and then the one where your, your pizza gets there and it's like, you know, your own music. So um, what this is really useful for is, is finding those areas, but also um, sometimes you'll get really lucky and one of the ideas you have is like, oh, it's brilliant. This is the one we got to do. And uh, that's a good time too. So how'd you feel about Crazy Ace? Do you feel like you could do that again yourself? It, it really does just take practice and you just got to get better yeah, at finding yourself. It's okay. I could definitely try it again because I did get crazy, but yeah, <laughs> I guess you could, you could like simplify it and let it be a feature of the solution. It doesn't have to be the full solution. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, right. I can do it. Cool, cool, cool. And then the last part is the Lean UX Canvas. And uh, we've asked everybody to put together a business model canvas. The Lean UX Canvas is very similar to that business model canvas. This is a little later in the game. So this is more when you have you know a rough solution and you're just trying to find out those specifics. You have a good idea of what you want to do. Uh, and it looks something like this. Um, this is kind of boring though, so I, I try not to use this one in particular. We're gonna walk mm -hmm. through it in these different sections and they are numbered and, and you do wanna fill them out in this order, uh, but we're gonna walk through them one by one. And uh, if you'd like, you can take notes and or you know think of your answers to these. Um, and it, obviously this will be recorded so you can go back through it too. Um, so first off, we have the business problem. So this is where you start. And you'll notice with all of them, with the worst idea, with crazy eights, and with this one now, we're starting off with a business problem, uh, assuming that we've got that through our research. So what problem does the business have that you're trying to solve? It's very important um, to think of this from a business point of view, because otherwise, you know, we could think of lots of different solutions to lots of different problems. But if it's not a problem that the business is having, or if you're going into business, a problem that your business is trying to solve, um, unfortunately, it'll peter out and you'll never actually get anything out of it. Um, 
And the second section is business outcomes. So how will you know that the business, uh, that you've solved the business problem and what will you measure? So this is a very practical, like what metrics are we gonna be using? One of the other ways to think about it is what will people be doing differently if your solutions work? So how do we make sure that uh, after people change this behavior, what behavioral change are we looking for? What's the wrong way for their behavior to change? So for example, with the worst idea, we had a couple of those where you know, we don't want the behavior to go this way. Uh, and then also, you know, metrics that you have like customer success, uh, liking it, uh, average order value, time on site and retention rate. Those are all very technical things. Um, but even that can be a really good metric for you. Uh, so that when you go through it, you can say, like, OK, yeah, we're hitting this target. We're hitting that target. We're hitting that target. We can tell that our solution worked. If you don't do this, it'll be really difficult to tell whether or not your solution is working. Because you'll see, oh, you know, some people changed, but like also some people didn't. Like I'm seeing all this yeah. stuff, but am I just in a bubble? Um, okay. So it's important to make sure you set this criteria up in the beginning. All right. The third thing we want to fill out is our user groups. So these are the uh, kinds of people I know you've narrowed down your user group for years. Um, but what kinds of uh, people or archetypes or customer segments? I know Raymond talked about customer segmentation yesterday. Um, of users and customers do we want to focus on first who buys the product or service who uses it those are two different things because the person who buys a product might not be the one who ends up using it uh, especially if you're going into something uh, like with with children a lot of times the yeah. child themselves isn't going to be the one who buys it so mm -hmm. that's what sure. i wanted to ask too like is it the parent that's the user or the child it was kind of confusing to us when we were when we were coming up with the business thing yeah, well, um, um, yeah, there's lots of products that are made for people who are not buying them. For example, Blackboard is one where I've never bought a subscription to Blackboard. I've never said Blackboard here, I'm giving you money. But they still make a product for students and SCAD is the one who buys that. Um, so when you're making that, you, you, it's okay to distinguish, okay, this is the person who's going to be buying it because they see the value in it for the person who is the user and they care enough about the user that they will be buying it on their behalf. Um, some products are, are like this are almost exclusively gifts. Some of them are less gift-based and more like what, what I think you guys are leaning towards. Um, but it's just important to consider all the different people who are going to be touching your product essentially because um, you need to make sure that uh, you're, you're speaking to them basically. So the packaging, for example, might be more focused on the parent, whereas the actual product itself and the experience might be focused on the child. Does that make more sense? Oh, yeah, it does. I, I, I wanted to ask, like, so who would like, be the main customer? Is it both parties or there's like a main customer? Yeah, we're not talking quite as much about customers and more about users. And in uh -huh. this case, the person who buys it is a little different than the person who uses it. And that's totally fine. You just need to consider them both, but not like completely. So like, for example, in, in your product, I'm guessing the child is going to be the one who, who uses it mostly. Um, yeah. So a majority of the product should be designed for that child. Um, but you might want to still have options for parents or parental controls or yes. messaging to parents that um, still, you know, acknowledges them. Okay, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. After we figure out what users we have, we think of the user benefits. So why these users would want to use our product. Uh, so what benefit they've gained from using it? What behavior change can we observe that tells us they've achieved their goal? That's a really big one. Um, so, for example, we'd be like, I want to save money, or I want to get a promotion, or I want to spend more time with my family. Um, for some solutions, it might be different, like for the pizza one, it might be that we want to, uh, you know, get the pizza to them faster, or I want people to smile more when I'm giving them the pizza, something like that. Um, that might be the, the user benefit that you're tracking for that. And then the middle, we have our solution. So this is where you would put something like what you thought of with your crazy eights or what you, uh, what you learned from your worst idea. Um, or sometimes you're just in the shower in the morning and you're thinking to yourself, you're like, oh my gosh, I've got it. The, uh, solutions can come from anywhere, but your actual solution to the problem goes in this middle white part. Um, and so you'd, you'd list different products or features or enhancement ideas um in that middle area so that you can kind of like say like this is our offering this is what we're doing like this is the plan for what that actual solution is 
the bottom row kind of deals with next steps. So in this case, it's hypothesis for this first one. Um, you're going to combine the assumptions from two, three, four, and five. So that was two, oh, two. So the business outcomes, the users, the user benefits, and the solutions into a hypothesis statement. So, and it sounds something like this. You'll say, we believe that business outcome will be achieved if user attains benefit with feature. And each sub hypothesis should feature or should focus on one feature only. A good example for this is for YouTube example when and, uh, they were implementing skippable ads. We believe that higher watch time will be achieved if people who watch videos online, that's their user group, attain saved time, the user benefit with skippable ads. And that's the feature. And usually you want to keep on doing this until you have one of these that covers at least each one of your other sections. So, for example, if you have something for parents and you want to be focusing on the parents as well as the child, you want to have at least two of these, one that focuses on parent and parent features, and then probably a couple that will focus on the child and the child features. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Cool. cool. This is like the hardest part, <laughs> coming up with your hypothesis. Um, and the reason we're coming up with a hypothesis is because we're going to be testing our solutions in a couple uh, days, or I guess in your case, like really soon. Um, in the middle part there, uh, the bottom middle, we want to know what's the most important thing to learn. So for each hypothesis from box six, and you might have two of these, you might have 10 of these, you might have 100 of these, I don't know, it depends on how many stuff you did before. Uh, but you're going to identify its riskiest assumptions and then determine the, uh, the riskiest one right now. So this is the one that's going to cause the entire idea to fail if it's wrong. Um, and this does require some level of like self criticism of like, you know, which which one's the best, you know, which one, if this ends up not being right, which one's going to cause this entire thing to crumble. And so that's what you need to test first, because everything else depends on that. Um, yours might be we're assuming that if uh, you know we give these children this specific product or we have this specific solution, they will feel closer to their cultural heritage. Maybe they won't, <laughs> and you don't know that until you try it, right? And so um, that's the kind of thing that you're going to want to learn uh, from from box six. All right, and then the last box, uh, box seven. What's the least amount of work we need to do to learn the next most important thing? Um, and this is really just asking, how are we going to prototype this? Um, for startup, you don't necessarily need to prototype anything to actually test it. Um, but in the real design world, a lot of times we'll put together lo-fi mock-ups. We'll do, um, you know, all these kind of like paper prototypes sometimes just to see if the, the general idea is even worth pursuing. And a lot of times it's not. It, a lot of times it doesn't end up being worth it. And that's why we do all these different prototypes. Um, but we want to learn the least amount of work that we need to do to learn the most important thing um, so that we can do that least amount of work and then learn the most important thing and then kind of move from there. Okay. All right, and those are the, the three different solutions or I guess ideation uh, strategies we have. We have the worst idea. We talked about crazy eights and then also the uh, lean UX canvas. Uh, and that is all I have for you today, Stephanie. Do you have any questions for me about any of the materials or uh, any guidance that I can offer for you and your team as you guys start to ideate? Uh, no, I don't think so. But I, I, I thought this was a really good session and I learned something from it that I actually wanted to ask before. So, yeah. I'm so glad. This is, um, this is like what I love the most <laughs> is ideating mm -hmm. and uh, trying to s solve problems. It's a lot of fun. And Crazy Eights is so versatile. It is so versatile. I have done crazy eights for every little thing. Like, I'm not even kidding. I did a sked pro where I needed to uh, represent a certain type of data on a button. And so me and two other people did crazy eights to try to figure out different ways to, I mean, it's a button. It's something like super small. <laughs> um, but even something as small as that can be uh, done with the crazy. And you get a lot of really good ideas really quickly, which is the benefit of doing crazy eights. So um, definitely take that back with film. You know, maybe you're trying to think of different ways to establish a shot or, you know, I have these constraints and, um, you know, I don't know what this uh, storyboard is going to look like. You know, maybe I'm going to try a couple different storyboards and I'll do a crazy eights to find the solution. Um, there's lots of different applications for it and I use it all the time. So um, definitely take that one with you uh, wherever you go. But yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And Stephanie, thank you for showing up and uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your startup.
Yeah, you too. Thank you. You're very welcome. Bye. And thank you, Pranchu, for hanging out. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the session now. I'll see you later, man. Awesome. Bye-bye.